Big Talks. So it's a bioinformatics and genomic seminar series that is launched then today. We are proud of this. So it's the topics of bioinformatics and genomics. And we believe that this is community building within SciLife Lab. So it's a joint effort for the SciLife Lab platforms to come together within these two topics. We are aiming to have these events four times per year. So it's today it's here in Uppsala. 1st of October, it will be in Stockholm. And then uh, later this year, November, December, we hope to have another event at any of the other SciLife Lab uh, nodes. It's a live broadcast seminar series, which is, makes this a bit unique compared to the other seminar series that SciLife Lab hosts. Uh, and it's uh, via the SciLife Lab YouTube channel. So my name is Jessica Lindvall, and I'm uh, a bioinformatician, project manager, and also training coordinator for the bioinformatics platform within SciLife Lab and BIS. And as this is the first event of these big talks, we would be happy to get comments and ideas, suggestions to improve or what to do better for next time, either in the break afterwards when we have some networking mingle. So please stay for that, or you can mail me for this. So I will leave the floor now to Adam Amur, who is the um, part of the NGI platform here in Uppsala, and he will present our great speaker for today. Thank you and welcome. Yes. Thank you, Jessica. So it's my pleasure to introduce Paul Lacaz. Uh, and Paul is the head of the Public Genomics and Health Program uh, in Melbourne, Monash University. Uh, so he's come all the way from Australia for us today. Uh, and he's leading a very interesting project in genomics that we'll be happy to hear more about. Uh, and I met Paul actually two years ago when he was visiting Sweden. It was in the middle of the summer, so no one else was here, basically, uh, but I was. And we got talking about some of the, of, of the possibilities for doing collaborations. And since then, we all also started to actually work together. And I'm very happy also to have an adjunct position now with Paul at, uh, at Monash University. Uh, so we are looking very much forward to hearing more about this and also to explore possible collaboration between SciLife Lab and, and the things going on in Australia. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thanks, thanks Adam for the introduction and it's great to be here. <coughs> so I've been coming to Sweden for many, many years actually. Um, my wife is from Sweden, even though we live in Melbourne. But yeah, I, I at one point th thought it would be a great idea to make contact with someone doing genomics here in Sweden. So I got in touch with Adam. And then as we spoke about genomics, we realized we were doing lots and lots of similar things uh, at the other end of the globe to each other. But it's been really good to be able to start to work together and hope, hope that continues for many years to come. So uh, I'm going to tell you today about a unique project that involves a, a cohort study and biobank of healthy elderly individuals in Australia and how we are um, doing lots of different types of genomics on this population that is showing us kind of a, a slightly new perspective for human genetics that's very unusual and di different from the traditional paradigm of, of clinical genetic testing or disease-based genetic testing. So as Adam mentioned, I'm from Monash University, so this is the largest university in Australia and I'm within the School of Public Health, which traditionally has done health service and epidemiology research and we specialize in large cohort studies and registries and clinical trials. And I joined a few years ago now to add a new arm of public health genomics to this program, which was really about assessing the value and utility of human genotype in the context of public health. So going beyond targeted genetic testing, more towards population screening or um, prevention using uh, human genetics. And we have these unique um, which I'm going to talk about today that, that we use as a foundation for doing a lot of this work. And what we're doing is kind of two arms of, of genomics. One is, is 
cohort scale <coughs> genome sequencing that we are uh, using these large community-based clinical trials um, as, as a foundation for that are accompanied with longitudinal phenotypic and clinical information which we can link to genotype. And this has taught us a lot about taking on large genomic projects that involve lots of collaborators, lots of issues and challenges related to compute, um, data security and, and data sharing and analysis, as well as the, the biobanking aspect connected to these studies. But in parallel, we also do a lot of work into ethical, legal, social issue, issues in genomics. And my colleague, Jane Tiller, is here in the front row. And she's a, a lawyer and now a genetic counsellor. So we've been working on issues like genetic discrimination and the use of genetic test results in insurance in Australia, uh, as well as issues related to direct-to-consumer testing. And we're beginning to get into a little bit of health economic analysis, which is quite um, topical, especially in Australia. We have a large program that's trying to introduce genomics into mainstream care, and that involves a lot of health economic studies to show the utility um, of convincing the government to invest in, in genomics for, for the general health of the population. We also have spent quite a lot of time on consent and return of results from cohort studies. So the cohort study I'm gonna tell you about today has consent for recontact, meaning if we find medically actionable or significant results, we, we can potentially make them available to the participants, which I'll, I'll touch on. We also, within the School of Public Health, have a large registry program, and it, our registries probably aren't quite as good as yours here in Sweden, uh, but we're working on trying to make them better, and also my role is to begin in, um, in integrating genetic test results into some of the registries that we have for cancer and rare disease in Australia. So Adam came out and visited us recently and we filmed a little conversation here which uh, took place in a coffee shop. It wasn't actually in a coffee shop, it was a blue screen and they spliced <laughs> that behind. But Ma Melbourne is known for its coffee culture uh, and so we talked about genomics and human reference populations. And this is actually already on YouTube um, if you want to go and check it out. <coughs> so uh, today I'm going to talk about these healthy elderly cohort studies and or one of them in particular. And why, so why is that important or interesting for genetics? So one of the big reasons is to study gene penetrance. So this is the phenomenon that exists in that pathogenic variants can be carried by different people in the population, the same variant, and the effect of that variant can have a different impacts on people's risk or, or whether they get a disease or not, even within a family of family members carrying the same variant. And typically we haven't looked with a focus on the people who are unaffected by pathogenic variants despite carrying them their whole life, which is what we have in, in our studies, which I'm going to talk about. And the other aspect is to create a reference population or a reference data set of confirmed healthy individuals who have reached a certain age without any genetic disease or any significant genetic disease that can then be used as a negative control or reference set for disease-based studies in genetics. And this is proving to be extremely important and valuable. And as we've seen with the EXAC database, it's now being used across the globe as a reference for allele frequencies um, and we think that having a, a well-curated, healthy population will be even more powerful to rule out um, variants that, that may not be pathogenic or to help interpret and assign pathogenicity to genetic variants, which is a huge challenge for us all. So ASPRI is the study I'm going to talk about today. It stands for Aspirin in Reducing Events in the Elderly. So it's actually the largest randomized control clinical trial that's ever been undertaken in Australia. And it, it, it's also, uh, there's a smaller population in the USA that were recruited and it's an NIH funded study. And the primary uh, question for this study is whether taking low dose aspirin every day when you're over the age of 70 prevents a range of diseases and increases your overall disability free survival in aging. And so a lot of people in this age group take aspirin thinking that it's going to be good for their general health. But the evidence for that, for primary prevention, for people who've never had a heart attack or any other issue before, wasn't actually there. So that was the rationale for setting up this study. 
And in order to, to power the study, we had to recruit 19,000 people, about 16,500 of them came from Australia. And so we partnered with uh, a huge network of general practice doctors in Australia and recruited, recruited people over the age of 70 into this study and then randomised them to daily aspirin versus placebo for five years, which is now finished. And we've measured the impact of aspirin on a range of outcomes from cardiac disease to stroke to dementia uh, to all different types of cancers to people's physical ability or disability. And so that has meant that we've had to collect a huge amount of information about all these people longitudinally at the same time as them being randomized to low dose aspirin. So it was a, um, and this was all set up and recruited bef before I ar arrived on the scene and started working on this study. So it was, it began uh, in, in 2010 and a huge effort went into recruiting this population. So we, we actually see every participant in face to face once a year and collect uh, a, a range of phenotypic and clinical information. Uh, which I don't have time to go into in detail, but it's everything from um, demographics. We do annual blood pathology. Um, we, we have four cognitive function tests that are done every second year. Uh, we have their entire medical history and clinical history, family history, um, physical function tests. Uh, and also, if anything happens to these people in terms of hospitalizations, we have various ways of capturing that hospitalization data, coding it into our database for the study endpoints. So the baseline data that was collected at study entry, we've had available for about a year to analyze, but the, the longitudinal study is now finished and the longitudinal data set is almost ready for analysis, which we're very excited about. Um, a huge amount of data. So these are the endpoints of the study that we code and categorize. So each cancer gets adjudicated of what cancer type happened and we collect the tumor tissue for most people that, that get cancer. And then we have death, dementia, depression, um, which are all adjudicated by committees to confirm what actually happened, as well as different cardiac events, stroke and bleeding events related to the risk of taking aspirin. So, and then when something happens, we go in and get the hospital reports and put them all into the database. So again, I don't have time to go into the details of all this, but we've collected over 5,000 endpoints now in, in the end of the study. So in addition to all that primary f trial data, there's 12 sub-studies that are looking at various things like depression or fractures in the elderly or age-related macular degeneration, taking retinal images. There's a brain imaging study doing MRIs. Um, and there's a longitudinal lifestyle questionnaire, uh, which is called this one here, also, which is information about occupational history, diet, all kinds of things. So late last year, the study safety committee made the decision to stop the medication period because the benefit, there wasn't a significant benefit being observed in terms of that people taking aspirin. In fact, there was risk associated with people taking aspirin related to bleeding and some, some other issues. And so the, the study period ended in its current form and we, we had to get everyone to send their tablets back. So here you can see SACS, this wasn't Christmas, Santa Claus coming, but it was actually thousands of, of aspirin and placebo tablets that people had to send back. And so now that the data has been analyzed for the primary outcome papers, which are going to come out this month or next month about what the results were in terms of the aspirin. And um, what we have proposed and hopefully will be funded very soon is to extend the study for another five years as an observational cohort. So we can continue taking all these measurements and look at the legacy effect of aspirin, but also just as a general aging study. We've, we've, we've done so much work to get to this point. Um, we've got a very strong case to keep things going. And that's what we're calling ex Esprit XT or extension. So the other thing that this study did, which had a lot of foresight, was to set up a biobank at the beginning of the study and collect samples from every, what. Well, ask each participant of the study to provide a 30 mil blood draw for research purposes. And we were able to collect that on about 15,000 of the participants, and this included consent for genetic research. 
and it, that, that blood draw was split into serum, plasma, white cells, red cells, different blood fractions. We ha also had urine collection. And we, we got these buses that would drive out to the regional areas and actually there's a lab on the bus that can collect the blood sample, spin it down so, and have it frozen within four hours, which all our samples were. And so the, the, this incredible resource was built, um, which has enabled genetic studies. And what you, you would appreciate as geneticists is that it's a very uniquely ascertained population. So these people weren't recruited because we want to do a genetic study. They were recruited for an aspirin study, but now we have the opportunity to do genetics. And so it's very rare to have a collection this size of people who were healthy at the time of study enrollment that we can now look at their, their genes. So I didn't mention it, but the inclusion criteria was anyone with a history of heart disease, a current diagnosis of cancer or cognitive de decline above a certain screening um, threshold were excluded from entering into the study. So we've got an enriched population for people that had to be healthy and over 70. Some are, were in their 90s at enrolment. And the GP had to make the assessment that they would be alive in five years. Um, so <laughs> generally an enriched, healthy population. Now the, the blood, as I mentioned, gets split into different aliquots for different types of biomarker or genetic studies, which we're now starting to do. And um, not only did we have the baseline collection, but we also did this entire collection again at three years into the study. We managed to get over 10,000 people to do a follow-up sample. So we can now look at these match samples to look at biomarker changes, uh, as well as the underlying germline genetics. So it's still a, a, an evolving study in terms of all the, the utilization of the biobank, but we've made a, a huge amount of progress, at least m in the germline genetic measures, which I'm going to talk about today. So we've screened almost the entire biobank population now with a, a targeted panel, which I'm going to talk about. We've been part of the National Whole Genome Sequencing Project where we've sequenced whole genomes of 3,000 of the oldest, healthiest people in this as a sub-cohort. We've done one de novo assembly of a healthy 90-year-old man, and we have begun doing these epigenome-wide association studies, or EWAS, using microarray chips to look at longitudinal epigenetic changes in the blood related to certain phenotypes, including dementia. And then we've, we are pursuing funding for a large study on clonal hematopoiesis, which are these somatic blood mutations that increase with age. And we're, we're just about to start profiling the tumor tissues. We, we want to do circulating tumor DNA studies, cytokine profiling, uh, with, et cetera. There's a, an effort to do lipidomics, proteomics, and it, it's getting bigger and bigger. So today I'm going to talk about these two mainly. Uh, so to focus on gene penetrance, as I mentioned at the beginning, so this refers to the number of individuals with a given variant that develop the associated disease or trait. So most genetic variants for adult onset diseases aren't fully penetrant, which means that you have people that can carry this genetic risk factor and never develop the disease. And it's a bit perplexing to everyone as to why that happens in some people and not others. And this is called incomplete penetrance or variable penetrance when the same variant has a different effect on different people. So we know now that there's probably polygenic factors or other factors contributing to risk, not just one variant, um, but there's also the environment and epigenetic factors and, and other um, factors that might be at play. So historically, we've been interpreting penetrance in people that turn up to a clinical genetic service with a genetic disease and their family members who get subsequently tested. We haven't been testing the whole population and we especially haven't been testing healthy elderly people and so as we begin to do that, as genomics becomes more pervasive, um, it, it allows us to reinterpret what we think penetrance looks like. And so that's what I'm going to talk about now. And so as I, this just illustrates what I just said in that it, the, the most well-known risk factors like mutations in the BRCA genes have a, a roughly 70% lifetime risk of breast cancer in frema, females. So it's well known that there are these people who remain non-penetrant or unaffected late in, into life, possibly their whole life, 
but they're rarely the focus of the genetic study or they're, as, they're less frequently ascertained for genetic research than the people down here who are early onset dis affected by disease. So what we want to do is find the people in our study who are in this category, i.e. carrying significant genetic risk factors, and compare their genomes to people who have early onset disease, ideally people with the exact same mutation, maybe even within the same family, and then see whether there are other factors in their genome that are influencing their risk or modifying their risk. And that the rationale would be if there were protective factors carried in these people that they could be used to inform risk mitigation or, or therapeutic strategies for that disease. And you could apply this to breast cancer, but you could also apply it to Alzheimer's disease and, and, and the APOE gene, which we're doing, um, heart, heart disease and cardiomyopathy and cardiac genetics, and, and you can go down the line. So what the goal of this project has been is to screen the, the best well-known genes used in clinical genetic testing and the mutations that have been reported elsewhere as pathogenic and clinically significant in this healthy elderly biobank population. And that's never really been done before. And we've partnered with um, Bobby Sebra, who some of you might know from Mount Sinai in, in New York, to, who had coincidentally designed this low-cost, high-throughput targeted sequencing panel to do exactly this. So they basically took all the genes that were known to be associated with cancer, genetic cardiac disease, pharmacogenomics, these are the genes that are defined as clinically actionable by the American College of Medical Genetics, if found incidentally, and as well as hundreds of, of single gene disorder genes and recessive genes all in one panel. So it's kind of like a panel of panels using AmpliSeq technology. So we've screened the entire biobank with this assay now, um, and we've sequenced over 11,500 samples. We're just waiting on the final batch that would take us to the, the full data set. And you can see here that uh, for those of you working in, in cancer or cardiac, we have very broad coverage of the, the most well-associated genes for cancer predisposition, as well as pharmacogenomics and other genes. So what I'm showing here is um, a frequency plot of all the variants that we found in our targeted panel across 750 genes, and then their corresponding frequency in NOMAD. And actually there's some variants here that were found in NOMAD that aren't detected by our panel. But by and large, what we see is a very good correlation between a common variants above um, you know, this, if, point, if 1% is considered rare, all of these variants are, are quite common. And there's good correlation between our assay and, and exome sequencing used in NOMAD. However, there will be important differences in frequency in a lot of variants that if they're biologically real or meaningful, might actually, actually be contributing to the healthy aging phenotype that we see in, in this population. Now, we can then look at certain sets of genes or variants to compare the frequencies between NOMAD. So for those of you who might not know, NOMAD or EXAC is an aggregated data set of exomes from lots of different studies. And it includes controls from case control studies. It also can includes some people that had genetic diseases, including cancer. So it's, it, is, it is a great reference control but it's not exclusively comprised of confirmed healthy adults of a certain age. So actually people don't know the age of, of collection for most of the exact samples. There's also some mis mixed ancestry in there, which could explain some frequency differences, whereas we have a largely Caucasian population. So anyway, this is showing the, the frequency of, of variants found in the ACMG list of genes. And you can see here, the majority of variants that you actually find are very rare, below, say, 1% um, allele frequency in the population. And if, you, if I go back here, if you zoom in on here, actually, there's just thousands and thousands and thousands of rare variants that are, are, are only seen once in our data set or, once or twice in, in Nomad. So I've actually got a graph to show that. So now the, the, the axis is only goes up to 1% or 2%. 2%. 
and you can see there's a huge amount of variance in this, in this range, but there's also a, a more diverse spectrum of differences between the two data sets. Some of that will be just because of sampling chance, but some of it we think will be significant in, in terms of a variant in a gene that leads to a phenotype. And it, uh, in there, there's even more uh, as you get rarer and rarer. So the, the, the variants that generally get returned to patients for a clinical action in a clinical genetic test tend to be very rare. And in the context of autosomal dominant disease, um, they're, they're described as actionable pathogenic variants. So what we did was look for those in our data set and see how frequently they're coming up in people that don't have these diseases. And we were quite surprised. So the, the threshold that we used, or the, there's, there's a couple of different ways that we're doing this, which I'm going to show you. But the, the most obvious one was to take all the things that have been reported pathogenic elsewhere, i.e. In, in ClinVar and other databases. This is where people can deposit a variant that they've diagnosed in a patient that they think is causative of the disease and say, yes, this is pathogenic. So we can take all of those reports and see how frequently we find those same variants in our group. And what we see is that we find lots of these mutations. And all of these, by the definition of the American College of Medical Genetics, should be reported back and actioned if found in, in people that, that, that these diseases can be prevented and mitigated by certain interventions. However, where we seem to be finding them in people in their 80s and, and 90s. So there's a couple of points that some of these variants that have been reported as pathogenic may not actually be pathogenic, they may be misannotated, or they have variable penetrance in that they can be the causative variant in someone with the disease, and they can also be found in a, in a person who remains healthy. And so it has implications about <laughs> risk assessment and um, predictive genetic testing. And so when you add all these up, the, the, we find them in about 3% of people in the study, which is roughly the same as what they've been reported in other younger populations or in EXAC. So we originally thought there might be a depletion of this, this type of variants, but it, that may still be true because it's very diffi difficult to define what is or isn't a pathogenic variant and different groups use def different definitions, but it's certainly not depleted to the point that you, we may have expected it to be. So the other way of looking at damaging variation rather than just relying on these databases like ClinVar is to do a bioinformatic prediction of what is a deleterious variant. And there's lots of different ways to, to do that, but <clears throat> the way that we've used has been the same method of the, the EXACT group and Daniel MacArthur, which is using this tool called Lofty, which just looks at frame shift, stop gained, and splice site mutations that are predicted to truncate the protein, which would lead to loss of function of that protein. And so, and, and then we apply some other filters to get only the high, conf <coughs> high confidence hits. And we, then we want to say, well, how often are these happening in these disease-associated genes on top of the ones that are reported as pathogenic in the database? And what's the overlap? So that's what we've done here for the cancer genes on the ACMG list. And what you can see in the bracket genes is that in blue, these are the number of variants that were clinically reported as pathogenic that we found in the healthy elderly group. And the red ones are the ones that we have been predicted to be deleterious based on the algorithm. And the green is the overlap where it was reported in a clinical, in a patient, and it was predicted deleterious, and so they're matched. And you can see that the overlap's not particularly good. So you get things that have been reported as clinically significant in a patient that don't meet the, the prediction algorithm, and you get lots of things in the prediction algorithm that have never been reported before, at least in ClinVar, as pathogenic. So you're finding something in a person without a phenotype that hasn't been reported before, so how do you interpret that? Um, so it's kind of raising a lot of questions, and you can see that some genes have a better representation in the databases than others. And this is the same thing now for the cardiac genes on, on the ACMG list, which a lot of these relate to the risk of sudden cardiac death. 
And you can see some of these genes actually have a lot better representation in, in some of the, in ClinVar. And we've, I should say that we're only looking at rare variants now below 1%. So one of the questions that this raises is, well, if these variants and these genes are clinically actionable, should we be returning these results to all these healthy elderly people that we're finding these mutations in? Which is a, a bit of an ethical dilemma because it may not be actionable in someone who's 90 years old anymore, especially if they've outlived their risk. So the definition of, of clinically actionable you know, might vary based on context. Um, do, so a lot of people involved in running the study have questioned whether people actually want to know this information or not, especially in this age group, which is a legitimate question. I mean, if, if these kind of variants uh, have a, a benefit for preventing disease, it, it makes more sense that you would find out about them earlier in life rather than later. But they do have familial implications, even if they're not penetrant in the, the elderly person. What would actually happen if we return these results? So would it lead to an intervention in the, the elderly individual or would it lead to family-based testing that would then lead to an intervention? And do we have a duty of care beyond the, the participant to reach those family members? What method should we use to return these? Should we phone people? Should we send a letter? Should we have opt-in or opt-out? Do their family members actually want to know what happens if people have passed away or developed dementia in the period since we've got these results? And is there genuine medical benefit ultimately to us returning these results? And that is still unclear. So uh, I wrote an ethics paper about all these issues, um, which you can see here. And one of the other things that came up was what would the insurance implications be in Australia of returning these results back to these families? And unfortunately in Australia, you, life insurance companies can still ask for and use genetic test results, including results from direct-to-consumer tests, um, and, and use them in assessments of life insurance risk. So we thought that that was pretty uh, a bad situation in Australia. So in Sweden, this has been banned a long time ago, as some of you may know. Most of Europe have actually banned this, the use of genetic results in all insurance, including life insurance. <coughs> So we've been lobbying the government to, to do the same in Australia and institute a moratorium or a ban on all genetic test results in, in insurance. So you, it, they can't be used in health insurance in Australia, um, but they can still be used in life insurance products, so that's an important distinction. Uh, and we have a, a, a hybrid public-private health system in Australia, so we still have public health, um, free health care for everyone, but then we have another layer of, of private health care. So anyway, we've made significant progress in trying to convince the government to pass legislation or a ban uh, on this, and we presented to a parliamentary inquiry into the life insurance industry, <clears throat> and we've been working with some cancer groups, charities, and we've written papers about it. And now that there's a national genomics initiative announced in Australia, we hope that that, that will expedite some regulatory change um, so that this barrier is removed for the progress of research and genomics in Australia. So what this whole exercise has kind of taught us is, uh, is there's a lot of parallels between the broader issues in genomics and population testing. So how do we um, deal with the scaling up of genetic testing to the whole population? Where is the value in, in preventing disease? How do we interpret a pathogenic variant when we find it in a healthy person or in a person without family history? Does it infer the same risk? How do we scale our genetic services uh, around, around that? Um, who's responsible for disclosing information and how? What do people actually want to know versus not know? And ultimately, is there medical utility in returning these type of results en masse? So these are kind of a lot of questions that we're interested in. And I think penetrance really is a, is a key issue and, and hurdle that we have to get over if we want to be able to use genomics more broadly. So in the second part of my talk now, I'm going to talk about the whole genome sequencing reference study that we've been part of, which is very similar to the SweGen project, which I know has been a big project here. So 
when having this biobank population, um, we were approached by another group in Sydney at the Garvin Institute who had just purchased the X10 system. This was a couple of years ago now, and they wanted to do a flagship reference project exclusively on healthy elderly people and create a, a data set that would be made publicly available and could be used as a control for the, for the whole genomics community. So we've done that and we've almost finished the project now. We've got a few more hundred samples to sequence. There's going to be 400 samples in this data set uh, when it's finished. And about 3,000 are going to come from our study and about 1,000 have come from another aging, well, another epidemiological study in, in, around Sydney. So the premise is to only, only take samples that have met a certain age and health criteria, which is listed here. So no, no history at all of cancer in their whole life and no severe cardiovascular or neurological disease above a certain age. And then they will all be processed using a, a, a pipeline, the same pipeline that was used here related to the X10 systems. And that involved high performance computing to do the variant calling and joint calling of data on this scale, which we, we, was done at the National Computation Infrastructure in Canberra. And then we, we have the data set which will be made publicly available as a, a joint called VCF for allele frequencies. <clears throat> and then there'll be a separate tier of application for the individual VCFs as well as phenotype data. Which, which is a different tier of, of application, but we're, we're, we're committed to making all of that available. And we've, we've had over 20 applications and we've provided individual VCS to all those groups, mostly from Australia, to, to do various things with the data. The main thing is to use it as a comparison against their disease population. And we've had groups working on every kind of disease that you can imagine that have now used this as a negative control, which is great. And now I'm beginning to get more and more applications for the clinical and phenotypic data from this group that we can begin to, to um, integrate as well. So we've, um, we've written a cohort design paper about it, which is available on BioArchive and is under review. And where the big paper with all the data in it, at least from about 3,000 samples, is also almost being submitted. I'm going to show some data from that. So there are other reference populations out there, including Swegen, and EXAC and a thousand genomes, which have various um, advantages. But we have some very unique advantages with this reference population, i.e. the confirmed health phenotype above a certain age, which we know and ha can have confidence in because we've, we've got the phenotype and curated information to verify that. Um, we have whole genome sequencing data, so it's not just allele frequencies based on SNP arrays or exome sequencing, it's whole genome data, which is quite new. We have 4,000 samples, which gives us a variant filtering capacity down to a pretty rare 0.0025, which is pretty good. It's not as good as having 100,000 samples, but it's quite good. And we have this commitment to making the data accessible at various different levels, um, which not all of these reference populations have that. So we've also built this website and beacon where people can look up their variants and see how frequently they were found in the data set. So this is very similar to, to what you guys have built here. We get beginning to see more and more people <coughs> using this. And there's, they've built, the guys at the Garvin have built on more and more functionality for live analytics of, of the, the data set. And I, I should have said that there, there are seven fields that we've provided, so age, gender, um, Glucose level, um, I can't, far, uh, yeah, it might be listed here. Yeah, so we, we've provided seven basic phenotypic data fields that are available to everyone, so you can filter on that. So you can filter on age and gender and, and some other basic characteristics, and then you can apply for access to additional information. So, um, yeah, lots of similarities with the Swegen project. So, so much so that we thought it would be really valuable to start comparing the data sets because they were processed using the same technology and very similar analytical pipelines. And the Swedish group were uh, a population-based sample aging, ra ranging in age from 20 to 90 years. 
So that gives some advantages in having a broader age range where ours are all healthy elderly. And so that is what I'm just showing here is that in Sweden you had a, a nice spread of ages and here we have more of a skewed older population which has advantages and disadvantages. So we've already started to do some analysis of running the same algorithm on both the populations and comparing the data. And one of the first things we did was look at telomere length. So whole genome sequencing is, is great in some ways because it provides you with all this additional information that is not just about the DNA sequence, but you can look at the length of telomeres, mitochondrial DNA mutations, you can look at somatic changes in the blood, you can look at copy number changes, you can look at structural variation. And so we said, well, let's have a look at telomere length. And in red here are samples from Australia. You've got, we've got some younger samples from another cohort here that were actually controls in a schizophrenia study. So they were young adults. And we've got all of the healthy elderly genomes up here. So what we saw in the Australian samples is that telomere length decreases with age, which we all knew already but then it seems to stabilize in these healthy elderly individuals, which might in part explain their health phenotype. However, in Suijin, there's a, more of a steady decline in telomere length across the age range. And although there's a lot of noise there, so you get, you get some people who have very short telomeres who are in the healthy elderly study, and you get some people with extremely long telomeres. And the telomere length quantification is not perfect with whole genome data. You're still just using kind of read depth based metrics, but it still is, is um, I think, a, a pretty good com combination of a, a huge amount of data from different cohorts. So the other thing that we've, we've done is these protein truncating variants predicted loss of function that I'd explained earlier. We thought, well, how often are they happening in a healthy elderly group that should be damaging? Well, it's actually not necessarily damaging variation because some of these loss of function variants can have a positive phenotypic effect or a protective effect. And that was recently shown in these two papers. I don't know if you've seen these, but they, they looked at these class of variants in the UK biobank and then matched them with the phenotypes of of certain genes and they claimed that some of these loss of function variants have a protective effect on some diseases and phenotypes. However, they used SNP array data to, to impute and measure these variants, whereas here exome sequencing data was used and for our, for our data sets we've got whole genome data. So there's some technical issues that we need to take into account, but what, one of the things that they reported in EXAC was on average, each individual carries about 85 of these predicted loss of function deleterious or protein truncating variants. And then in the UK Biobank, they found a similar rate per individual. And this was using exomes versus SNP arrays Knowing that the, in, in EXAC, there's actually um, people who have had cancer from the TGCA, I, I think, in that data set. And in the UK Biobank, there's lots of people of all varying ages with different types of diseases, potentially genetic diseases. So you might have some individuals who, are, who have lots of these type of variants which are skewing the population, or the fact that you've got very large sample sizes might mean that on average, you're, overall, you're detecting a lot more of these variants than you're averaging them out per individual. But what we found when we looked in our healthy elderly group which is about 2,500 genomes for this data set and Suijin, was that we found significantly less of these class of variants per individual. And when we first saw it, we thought, wow, that might be the reason, that might be related to healthy aging. But then Suijin is from a, a wide age range. It doesn't necessarily ma make sense. And that we we're also quite skeptical about technical artifacts across these different sequencing technologies that might be in part explaining this. And also, the, 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 in the end of the day, they're still only predicted, they're still only predictions. So we don't have a huge amount of confidence that they are actually explaining any given phenotype at this point. So the last thing that, that I'm going to show you is some of the the changes that we're seeing in the genome 
related to genomic aging. So this is how the genome changes as you get older. So you, your core sequence might stay the same, but things happen like your telomeres change. Your mitochondrial genome can change or the number of mitochondria that you have can change. And so I'm going to show you some of the, the things that we've found. So the other thing that can happen is you can get somatic mutations happening in subsets of your blood cells that tend to happen more with aging, specifically in cancer genes. And what we see here is now, this is again the, the controls from a schizophrenia study uh, and, and other cohorts, that these class of mutations then increase rapidly over the age of seven, 60 and 70. <laughs> and that they increase the risk of, or they're probably like a, a representation of how your risk for cancer increases as you get older, because your general ability to um, maintain a kind of stable level of somatic mutation tends to decrease as you get older, and that can result in all types of cancers. And you see this in, in the peripheral blood cells, which are the cells that we use to do this, the sequencing. And a sub, subset of that is clonal hematopoiesis, which is predisposing to blood cancers specifically and is known to increase substantially after the age of 70 to the point that you know, a quarter of all people over the age of 70 or 80 have mutations in these known um, CH genes that can predispose not only to blood cancers but also now to cardiovascular disease and stroke and, and actually are linked to reduced, mortality or reduced lifespan. And then when we look at mitochondrial DNA, we can use that to count the number of mitochondria per nuclear genome in the blood. And we see that that decreases as well with age, um, which is, has also been reported elsewhere. So we can kind of make a, a joint metric of genomic aging using different properties of the whole genome sequencing data. So with that, I'll tie up and just summarise in that I hope I've been able to show you that this uniquely ascertained healthy elderly group provides some unique windows into human genetics, particularly in relation to penetrance, uh, which has implications for clinical genetics. However, it, they can also act as an important and much needed, well curated reference population that, that the broader community might have benefit from. So with that, I'll, I'll end and thank all of the fantastic people involved in this study, of which there are many, including all of our fantastic field staff who run the study, the executive director of the study, uh, Robin Woods, the PI and head of school, uh, John McNeil, as well as Jane Moeen and, and other members and, and all our collaborators, and particularly the Esprit participants themselves who have been so generous with their information and time over the years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. So are there any questions here in the audience? Everything was clear? Oh, let's see. There's one over here. Hi, so my name is Klaus Lorival. I work is, uh, with clinical genomics. It's on? Yeah. Or it's not on? It's, it's only for the camera. Right? Okay. Good. <laughs> So um, I'm uh, congratulations for a fantastic study. It's Thank really you. interesting. And uh, I was just wondering for the clinical interpretation of your variants, uh, do you have any collaboration with clinical geneticists or so on? Because I'm thinking of your uh, contradictory studies when it comes to uh, bioinformatic interpretation of yeah. uh, variants and clinical reporting of variants, yeah. which is well known in a way. So just Yeah, we, we have built some partnerships with clinical geneticists and we've got a kind of cancer group and now we've just put a cardiac group together <coughs> and then we'll probably have a neurological group so we'll basically give all the cancer results to cancer specialists who will curate and interpret that help us curate and interpret the data that will be done even just for publishing the research findings because you know a lot of these variants can be ruled out or they need expert interpretation as you know and but particularly if we're going to report them back to the participant they need to be very very carefully curated and validated we need to we also need to do the Sanger validation of sequencing to confirm technically what we found 
And we know that there's some sequencing artifacts in there. We've been able to get rid of some of them, but there's probably more. And so, yeah, we've, we're putting that together locally in Australia, and those people would be connected to the return of results if, you know, eventually that happens. Um, so, yeah, we, we've, we've been putting that together. And it's impossible for us to do it all ourselves because we've got all these genes that touch on all these different diseases, each of which has domain-specific expertise in clinical genetics that we really need. Okay, so my name is Elsa Johansson. I'm working with genetic epidemiology. Uh, so I had two images that I, I mean, you mentioned, but you didn't give a very good explanation. And it was first the one that, where you showed that it, there was a bad overlap between the clean var and the predictions. Mm. And then one of the last one, when you did show that the number of loss of functional variants per individual differed a lot between the different cohorts. Mm. And I mean, you didn't say very much about what you thought was the most likely explanation for these deviating results. So maybe you can try to say something more mm. about it. Well, the first part is I don't believe a lot of the predictions. And if we, you know, if we looked at everyone in this room, that we would all have predicted pathogenic mutations in cancer genes and cardiac genes. Well, not all of us, but a lot of us. So I think there's false positives in the prediction algorithm. And I think there are misannotated reports of pathogenicity in ClinVar. We, we all know that that's the case. Um, but I do think also the, in five years' time, if you did it again, there'd be probably be better overlap because there'd be more stuff reported in ClinVar, hopefully, that is real and it just hasn't been publicly deposited yet. With the genome-wide loss of function analysis, as I said, there are some technical issues there with different platforms to measure genetic variation that concern me a little bit. And there's ethnicity differences. And so I think there, there might be some biology in there. Um, but those, I think if you removed all technical issues, the groups would become closer together rather than further apart. Okay, just a follow-up, but do you think that they are overestimated in the other cohorts or underestimated using your method? Because I guess that's quite important when you mm. want to use it in the clinic, for example. Yeah, I think that they're overestimated in the other cohorts, but I still think they're, in the end of the day, predictions that will have lots of false positives. So I don't think they should ever be used clinically, but the, the same criteria that we use there are used to identify a, a clinical pathogenic variant, but the difference is they ha you have, it has to match the phenotype in the patient, um, or at least it should, to explain the disease, whereas we're not matching to phenotypes here yet. Um, but you know, I do think in the past someone would have had a predicted variant and it, matched, it happens to fall in the gene that matches the phenotype and they've used it to diagnose the case and it's actually not the causative variant. I think that will have happened quite a lot, and we, I think we've already seen reports of where that's happened. So, anyone else? Hi, my name is Johan Dahlberg. I'm a bioinformatician at the National Genomics Infrastructure. Thank you for an excellent talk. Uh, my question is, are there any plans for being able to federate data analysis across centers and countries and so on? Because you demonstrate very clearly here that there are obvious benefits to that. Yeah, definitely. So our collaborators at the Garvin Institute are working towards that. And I know people like Adam are as well. And there's these beacon networks that have emerged where you can search for a variant in lots of different data sets at the same time who are connected to this beacon network, which is good. Um, it's a good start, but y you probably need to do a bit more than that, and you probably need access to that, to the raw data in a lot of cases, and that's obviously fraught with more difficulties. Um, and the other problem we've had is how do we actually transfer the data to people who want the BAM files when it takes a month or two to transfer the data alone? And then you've got to pay hundred, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a year in storage costs. So there's there's technical obstacles to data sharing, and there's e ethical and governance issues 
which we've tried to fast track our way through by saying from the beginning that we're going to share the data. And that was actually part of the funding that we had to do that from the beginning. So we had to find ways of making it work. And we've, we've come up against obstacles um, mainly related to the data size. So more, more people than we expected want to get access to the BAM files. And currently we've said, well, if we can give you a login to the high performance compute and you can analyze BAM files if you really need to. Um, but we can't transfer them around at this point. But what people really want to do is compare this data set with another one and another five. And that's data federation and I just don't think it's been figured out yet. So I'm, I'm not smart enough in, in, with computers to be able to figure that out. But hopefully um, it can get better and better. What we've been able to do between our groups is develop code that we've run on our data, send that to Adam, and he's run the exact same code on his data, which is, it's not ideal, but it's, it's about as good as I suppose we can do at, at this point. Yes. So I, I guess I have one question here that is perhaps more practical. Now that you have generated all these healthy genomes, uh, and there are also other resources available, so for anyone who would like to do filtering to find you know, if a variant is causative, how should that person do? Which data sets should it look into? Should it use mm. yours in combination with Gnomad and so on? Or yeah. how are you thinking yeah, about Yeah, well, that? we've seen people develop clinical tools where they'll just have like five columns of variant frequencies. They'll have exact 100 thousand gen genomes. They're using ours now. Some people, they might have yours there. And then so they can just look at the frequency across multiple different reference populations when they're interpreting a variant. Um, but yeah, it, it would be nice if they were all together somehow. Um, maybe we'll get there one day. But for the people that I've seen using it, they just kind of interpret the, each of them differently or separately. All right. So if there are no more questions at this point, we thank Paul again. And then there will be some mingle and, and lunch served outside. Thank you.